Here we are at Deep Dive video number 3 on the Zox Nauseous Synthesizer. I'll be covering the hardware components of the synthesizer. I had a number of goals in mind for the hardware. Voice card architecture. I didn't want to design with limited function. Actually, I didn't really know what I wanted. But whatever it was, it should be expandable and configurable. Using voice cards gives flexibility here. Standards-based integration. The platform should be open. I use a Raspberry Pi, but maybe that'll change to STM32 in the future. I don't know. Or if you want to integrate a voice card with an Arduino, that should be a possibility. Any voice card, any slot. The slots should not be special. Do not require a VCO in slot 1, a filter in slot 2, etc. If you want all slots filled with the same oscillator board, that should be allowed. All voice card outputs available to all the other voice cards. Each voice card is in charge of its own modulation options. Any analog signal from a voice card should be on a shared bus. So we'll see how these goals make their way into design. These will come across as we examine the Zox Nauseous signal bus, the backplane, and the voice cards. Very quick review on what was covered in the first two deep dive videos. We started this journey with an introduction to the Zox Nauseous synthesizer and discussed VCV Rack as the synth's front end. The second video then showed how to stand up a Raspberry Pi with two USB audio interfaces and MIDI. If you want to learn more, check out those videos. Enough background, let's dive into the Zox Nauseous signal bus. These signals get delivered via this backplane to every voice card. The bus is divided into three sections, digital, power, and analog. I'm going to start the digital section with the slot address lines, shown as I to C address on the schematic. We've got three address lines to identify the voice card slot. These are hardwired by the backplane. Slot A is set to 000 and increments by 1 for each slot. The backplane itself takes the last slot with address lines of 111. It's a bit of real estate to take three pins to pass the slot number to the voice card, but doing so ends up simplifying things. An alternate approach here may have been to use jumpers on the voice cards for addressing. Yuck. Next, let's talk about I squared C. These are the SDA and SCL lines. I squared C is a common lower speed protocol that allows multiple components on a single bus. The Zox Nacha synth uses I squared C because each I squared C peripheral has a separate address, allowing the Raspberry Pi to communicate with any chip on any voice card. Each I squared C chip has a particular 7 bit address for that communication. In choosing chips for the design, Voice cards use I squared C chips that allow at least three bits of address to be specified. Then these I squared C address bits are hooked up to the three slot address lines that I just mentioned. Simply stated, each I squared C chips address is unique within the Zox Nauseous system, based upon which slot the voice card is inserted to. This fits with the design goals of allowing any card in any slot and allowing duplicate voice cards to be installed. So, what types of functions run over I2C? Voice card identification is a significant one. At system startup, the Zoxnacha synth queries known I2C addresses, checking to see if a voice card is installed. Each voice card has an I2C ROM listening at these addresses. If a voice card is installed in a slot, the voice card's I2C ROM chip returns the ID of the voice card. This gives the synthesizer a complete view of which voice cards are present and what slots they're in, and also what slots are vacant. The list of installed voice cards is communicated to the VCV Rack front end via MIDI. In the first deep dive video, I discussed the discovery request and discovery report messages. Those messages are based on the I squared C queries I just discussed. Another use for I squared C is controlling digital switches with GPIO expanders. The voice cards have GPIO expander peripherals which are then used to control muxes and switching components. That's all a fancy way of saying the synthesizer patch is set up via I2C commands. The switches and muxes set the signal routing on the voice cards. Why GPO expanders? Putting all these signals on a shared bus just isn't feasible. Putting a GPIO expander on each voice card is a simple solution to this. Here's what does not go over I2C. 
digital to analog converters. For that, we turn to another multi-device protocol, SPI, or Serial Peripheral Interface. With SPI, the Pi host provides a clock signal and data can be transferred to or from a voice card. The clock speed is configured at 12 MHz, decently fast to provide updates to all the voice cards. Unlike I2C, which uses an address for each peripheral, SPI must set a chip select on the device it talks to. For that, the signal bus provides two chip selects to each voice card, so each voice card can have up to two SPI devices. We've got six voice cards, so that's 12 chip selects required to control everything. Oh, and the backplane has a DAC, so another chip select goes to the backplane. 13 chip selects, and here's where an issue comes up. The Raspberry Pi only provides two chip selects. To go from the Pi's two chip selects to the 13 the Zuxnoshis voice cards require, I used multiplexers, one multiplexer for each of the Raspberry Pi's chip select signals. Then, before updating a voice card over SPI, the Pi sets the multiplexer to that voice card. Then standard SPI transactions can proceed, communicating with only the selected voice card. To update to a different voice card, the Pi changes the multiplexer and a new voice card is selected for SPI transactions. The final pin on the digital side is called GPIO Module Driven. This is each voice card's direct line back to a Raspberry Pi GPIO pin. The backplane routes each voice card's GPIO Module Driven output to a unique GPIO on the Raspberry Pi. The purpose of each output is voice card driver dependent. With the existing voice cards, I'm using this output for calibration. Analog voice cards are designed to send back a pulse wave on this pin. By measuring the frequency of the pulse, the card's oscillators and filters can be tuned. Other calibrations should be possible as well, I just haven't got to them yet. Let's take a detour and talk about how calibration works. The analog voice card's frequency-based components work on a volt per octave scale. What that means is if you apply a voltage V, the oscillator or filter operates at a frequency F. An increase by one volt on the input and the frequency doubles or increases by one octave. Given that relationship, the graphs are going to look a lot cleaner if we set the Y scale to logarithmic. There we go. The volts per octave relationship says nothing about what voltage produces what frequency. It only defines that a given change in voltage produces a given change in frequency. So it's up to the circuit designer who might define that, say, zero volts is an A0 for example. A different design can have a different definition of zero volts, and it would still be a one volt per octave system. Given that quite inadequate background, let's go back to this GPIO module driven pin. With the voice card driving Raspberry Pi GPIO, the Pi can be used to measure frequency from the voice card. During calibration, we know what frequency we're targeting, and we're measuring that actual frequency being produced. Based on this, we've got an expected frequency and an actual frequency. This really isn't all that math heavy, so let's walk through what calibration does. Here I've graphed a range of 7 volts, with an output frequency range of 7 octaves. We know what frequency we expect at each voltage, shown as blue circles. Then the red stars show how much a voice card deviates from the ideal curve. Oh, and there's nothing special about calibrating at each octave. You could do a fewer or more calibrations depending on what you're shooting for and how quickly you can take measurements. It takes about 20 seconds to tune everything in the Zoxnosha synthesizer. So let's get this data corrected. We'll dive into these two points and set up corrections for them. We'll start on the left and zoom in there. The difference isn't apparent yet. Zoom really close so we can see the differences. We might find around 1 volt the output is a little flat, and here is where we correct that. This point is shy of 30 millivolts. The scary math moves the measurement left to where it should land on the ideal curve. That's the correction value. What this value tells us is that if the front end requests 0.97 volts, we actually need to output 1 volt. Okay, so we corrected a single value. We can do a lot better than that. Take a look at the second value and correct it. We'll correct for this value next. Zoom in close again. This one is a tad high. Similar math, this time moving the point to the right. 
And now we know if the front end requests 2.04 volts, we ought to output exactly 2 volts. Then it's time for the big leap. We'll use our two sets of points and do some interpolation between them. We're assuming the analog components are linear between our measurement points, and this turns out to be a reasonable assumption. Now, whenever VCV rack requests a voltage, V in, we look at the table we created and say, oh, well, I think you'd be much happier with V out instead, and set values based on that. Given memory is cheap, this is all stored as a lookup table for each voice card. A table makes it easy since in the code we're not really using voltage values, but instead 12-bit values for a digital to analog converter. The process of correcting between two points is then repeated for each pair of measurements, so all octaves are calculated. Once done, all voice cards have accurate and consistent tracking. And here's the results, showing it off on my ugly scope on the right side. We apply the same virtual voltage from VCU rack to different oscillators and a resonant filter. We get acceptable outputs for tracking across octaves. And that's calibration. Next we've got the power section. Power is pretty straightforward, so I'll keep it brief. The Zoxnosh synth uses Eurorack power levels, plus 12 volts, minus 12, plus 5. I put these in the middle of the connector. Okay, that might be a little bit odd. But there's a reason for this. It really helps out in routing. With the plus 5 on the digital side, and the plus 12 minus 12 serving the analog side. And that's power. Using Eurorack levels aligns with my standards goal, so check mark there. On to the analog section. The remaining signals are part of the analog bus, which are driven by the voice cards. Let's start at the very end, pins 39 and 40. This will help explain the rest of it. Each voice card drives the last two pins of the bus with its output. I call these last two pins this out one and this out two on the schematics. These this signals are whatever might be appropriate for the voice card. It could be two VCO outputs, it could be a stereo output from a filter, or any other signal. The voice cards are all output audio rate signals as outputs, but there's no strict requirement there. It could be a slow control voltage. To get from the this output pins to the slot specific pins is a job for the backplane. Based on whatever slot the voice card is inserted to, the backplane routes the this signals to slot specific pins. Then all the signals on the analog bus are available to be tapped into for each voice card. This is how each voice card gets access to the other cards. Tap into the signal and it can be used for modulation or whatever effect the card does. With this, the goal of having each voice card's outputs available to all other voice cards is accomplished. And it's actually one better than that. The voice card can use its own signals as input or feedback. An alternate solution here would be for each voice card to identify the slot and drive the slot specific pins. That's a lot of added logic and complicates routing in the voice card, so leave that job to the backplane. And that lonely pin 37, what to do with it? This is reserved for future iteration of the backplane. It's likely going to be for taking an external analog signal, which can be processed by the Zoxnosh synthesizer. This would allow one to integrate other sources into the synth for processing. Hook it up to your rack or another audio source. Then use the voice cards to do what you will with that source. I'm looking forward to making that happen with a future iteration of the backplane. And with that, I'll wrap up this deep dive on the Zoxnosh synthesizer. If you made it this far, I assume you found at least something interesting. Thanks for following me on this three-part series as we went from the VCV rack front end to the Raspberry Pi controller, and ending here with the hardware bus and voice cards. All the code and schematics are up on GitHub if you want to continue exploring. That said, I'd love to answer questions you might have or hear your comments on what you've seen. Just drop a note. Thanks for watching.